Hello everyone, welcome to the Mad Mac Dialogues. Today I'm here with Leo, also known as the Swedish Historian. I highly suggest you subscribe to his channel. And today we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of letting Ukraine and Georgia enter into the NATO alliance. So, how would you like to begin this? Right. So, if you think about Ukraine and Georgia, they're both pretty peripheral nations. They both border Russia as their main uh, neighbors, and they're both kind of in this NATO-Russia conflict for the last few years. In the case of mm -hmm. Georgia, since 2008, and in the case of Ukraine, since 2014. With and, the invasion of Crimea. Right, right. Uh, so Russia came over and they annexed it, and there's also they also have some of their military over in the Dusnesk and Luhansk. The politics in Ukraine have also been very influenced by ethnic tensions and or whether they want to stay with Russia or whether they want to integrate with Europe. But it seems that in modern Ukrainian politics, they have been shifting much more towards going with Europe. What do you have to say about this? Well, I think that's basically right. You know, there's a big difference between Eastern and Western Ukraine historically, but those views have also harshened over the years as this war with this kind of like proxy war with Russia has been going on. A lot of people has turned towards joining the West outright. So I checked from a couple of years ago and it's about 70 plus percent that wants to join NATO and the like and the government wants as well. But of course, this also spells a lot of conflicts. I've seen the statistics saying that, but I... The main concern when it comes to joining NATO for a country like Ukraine is, I think it's Article 5 of their treaty, it states if one ally is invaded, then it's an invasion on all and they must come to defend it. I don't think many countries would really be willing to defend Ukraine when, while they, or when they admit them to the alliance. So what do you think would happen if they joined? Would the allies actually follow through with this part of the treaty or is it not worth letting them in? I think, to a large degree, it's not worth fighting over the parts that are already lost. So I don't know if the French military and the British military and the US military would necessarily want to go into Crimea and those parts. But I do think there's a lot of will to kind of prevent further losses. So one of the mm -hmm. things that has been discussed is letting them in, but not uh, doing so, the Article 5 covers the conflict regions right now. So okay. that's the part that I'm more sympathetic to. Yeah, I think that Ukraine has a lot to gain from joining the alliance, especially protection, but they may have to do a bit of bargaining and uh, may have to, they may have to compromise with Russia and like let go of some of those lands before they join. Yeah, so I think Ukraine... It's kind of stuck in this limbo right now, right? So mm -hmm. it has these conflicts. It has these ties to Russia, but it also has some ties with the West. And right now, it's it can't grow its economy. It doesn't really know quite what to do, and it's kind of left out in the cold. So mm -hmm. something really needs to change for Ukraine. Well, it's interesting because Russia... I mean, I respect Russia a lot, but... To a certain degree, let's say. I mean, I think yeah, the sorry. partnership between the United States and Russia is almost necessary going forward. But I'm going to speak in the present here. Or If Russia is trying to gain Ukraine and Georgia on its side, but the way it goes about doing it is they're doing it all wrong. Because they're repelling the countries that they want as allies away from them. Both of those countries used to be part of the Commonwealth of Independent States. That was created right after the Soviet Union fell. But then with the subsequent invasions of both those countries they've left like they're not doing a good job of getting them on their side by being aggressive towards them yeah and it's it's kind of been a loss for russia i mean they've lost a lot of eastern europe that hates them now poland and certainly the baltic states and i think a big degree of russia is very fearful of losing more influence so that's part of why they that's went right. in in the first place. And a lot of it has to do with their demographics too, because they have a very low birth rate and 
if they can't get their demographics under control, they won't have enough people to actually uh, mm-hmm. get those lands back under their control in the future. But not only that, mm-hmm. they'll have such a large elderly population, such a small young population, that they'll turn completely inward due to their economic problems. Yeah, it's it's really a free strike against Russia. There's so many problems coming. And I think a lot of the solutions that Russia are going through is they're pushing too hard when they need to be a little bit softer. But it's also kind of, it's gotten to a point where they've burned so many bridges that they don't really know quite what to do, it seems like to me. Yeah, they're not really going to get Ukraine and Georgia back onto their side, at least for another half century. Those countries are some of the strongest pro-West pro-American countries there are out there these days. Yeah. So kind of one thing that's been a big problem for NATO and West is how Russia's been going into these countries. And it's kind of soft blocking countries by uh, occupying uh, so that they can't join NATO, right? So you talked Mm -hmm. earlier about Article 5 and how if someone is invaded or there's conflict, everyone's brought in. But the flip side of that has also been that Russia starts these cold conflicts that then kind of locks them out of the Western system. So, I mean, with Georgia, you have Abkhazia and South Ossetia, right? So mm-hmm. they haven't, hasn't happened much there for pretty much over 10 years, but it's still kind of, they're out there and nothing's happening. And in Ukraine, it's the same. And this kind of, salami slicing or like soft veto right is i think pretty bothersome to a lot of the nature countries but they also like you said why would a frenchman fight for ukraine i'm not talking about morally like they want to uphold shared values like democracy but in terms of actually security interests uh russian allied ukraine is really not an issue for france as much as it would be for, say, a country like Poland or Romania. Eastern countries, like the Baltics, are the countries that care more because they already border Russia and they could use some less pressures. But if you go mm-hmm. further and further away, it's kind of like, why are you disrupting these business ties? And why are we fighting for people we don't know? And when Russia is a lot more committed than we are personally. Yeah. And these countries can't really do a whole lot because their entire foreign policy is completely influenced by Russia's strings. Because if they say the wrong thing or they do the wrong thing, then Russia can just easily go in and intervene. Yeah. Oh, I was actually going to say something interesting about Georgia. They, um, I've talked about Georgia actually in a few of my videos. First of all, in the video that I made specifically about Georgia, and then in the one I made about Turkey becoming a great power, there is a chance that Georgia would actually opt to have an alliance with Turkey against Russia because Turkey actually respects Georgia's um, territorial integrity and Georgia also has a great alliance with Azerbaijan. So they may ally with each other against Russia, but this could be bad news for Armenia. Yeah, for sure. Armenia and Russia has pretty big ties. Um, but like for Turkey, I mean, they kind of have that on off relationship, but for them, if they could have George join, it would put a lot of pressure off them personally, as they wouldn't be the only, um, NATO country in the Middle East for sure. So I could see that. Yeah. The way I see it though, is that Turkey is trying to gain influence in a lot of these countries and they're almost starting proxy war. I predict that there will be many proxy wars between Turkey and Russia in the future. Like, Ukraine might be another example because Turkey is a staunch supporter of Ukraine. And Turkey may also have interests in the Balkans, like with Kosovo and uh, Mm -hmm. Russia is allied with Serbia. So I could see something happening there, but also in the Caucasus and maybe even Central Asia. Right, because, I mean, there's so many, like, of the Turkey people everywhere. And Turkey's been reasserting so many of the powers. So there's so much potential for Turkey pretty much anywhere now. Yeah, ever since the Soviet Union fell, a lot of these Turkic majority areas have become independent. And 
Turkey has been able to use its leverage to get them onto their side. Yeah, I do wonder about, like, I think Central Asia is hard for Turkey to kind of break into because it's such mm -hmm. a, like, a high conflict uh, area that's been fought over for between, like, China and Russia. But yeah. I do think the potential for Turkey is, like you said, it's pretty much endless. And I think they're taking a lot of that potential and influence in like Syria and Iraq and pretty much anywhere they can find it these days. Yeah, Turkey may protect Islamic interests in Central Asia because the way I see it is China is probably going to win out there. But if Turkey wants to defend the interests of the Islamic minorities there, then, well, we'll call them minorities because they'd be <laughs> under Chinese influence. Uh, then Turkey may send in some troops to help them out there. I don't see why they would allow their Turkic brothers to come under a country like China, which actively persecutes Turkic peoples within their own borders currently. Yeah, right. The Turkic Brotherhood. But Turkey has mostly stayed silent about the Uyghurs currently. But I'm thinking that once China comes closer to their doorstep, then they'll take a much more aggressive stance against that. Hmm. And I don't see really Turkey and China having any partnership in the near future. Interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, Turkey is really that gateway between, like, Asia and Europe. But they also have so much in those parts of Asia. I do wonder how much... Chinese influence will grow in these parts of the world. It seems like China is just rising and rising, but meanwhile they have all these issues with demographics and, uh, you know, the legitimacy of their government is based on GDP growth. Mm -hmm. So like, there's so many of these things, and same with Russia, that makes you wonder like what's going to happen in the future. I think, the, as I explained in my last video, Russia and China are just so insecure about themselves because they know that an impending crisis is coming because the demographics are just going to kill those countries and they need to get a grab on the land and the resources as quickly as they can. Right. You grab it and then it's locked and then no one can touch it, even if you grow weaker. Yeah. I see China is maybe gaining a small sphere of influence in Central Asia and maybe Siberia, but that's only if they can succeed. But as I described, there's just so many factors that would go into that, that even though it seems like a logical possibility, I just think they're going to mess everything up. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. There is the Belt and Road Initiative, but I mean, China does have kind of tendency to push their luck a little bit, like Russia. Mm -hmm. Like, they have such a big domestic audience that they need to kind of show that they're doing these things in order to kind of prove that they're the right government and prove that they're doing the right things. So sometimes they end up insulting or being too hard on who could be their friends, really. Yeah, they have a lot of, they, a lot of their closest neighbors are enemies. Japan, South Korea, I don't well, South Korea is not as big of an enemy, but still, it's more allied with the United States. And of course, India is a big enemy, and then Vietnam, and all the countries in the South China Sea. Like, China is just such an aggressive neighbor. They don't want to be part of it. They are actively fighting against Chinese influence. If China messes up its relationship with Russia, then they're done, because they're surrounded on all sides, basically, by enemies. Yeah. It's really true. They have pretty much a border dis dispute with every single neighbor of theirs. Have you seen the Caspian Report video on that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you made me, me think too. about that. They've got so much stuff going on. I think it's almost like a power play. They're just trying to tell those countries that they are the dominant country in the region, and their culture has been spread to all these different areas, and therefore all its surrounding nations should respect its authority right but when you demand respect it's also kind of has the potential to backfire right that's true yeah but i mean in the case of china they have all these this money while for russia it's kind of 
they're kind of running out of the money. China's economy is growing for the time being. I don't see it growing in 20 years, but yeah. Russia is hitting stagnation and their demographic problems couldn't be worse. Like, I can't think of another country, maybe besides like Belarus and Ukraine, that have such serious demographic problems. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, like, some of the issues with like Ukraine and Georgia um, joining NATO on these things is kind of people talk about it pushing away Russia. Do you think mm -hmm. Russia can kind of be, be gotten back into the fold, you know, kind of ally with the West again? Do you think yeah. that? Yeah. Because they might want to, uh, that it would be for Russia's interests to be allied with the United States. However, I don't see how they would want to do that if Ukraine and Georgia are NATO members. Mm. I think that Russia would be very uh, indignant about that. In many respects, I see Ukraine and Georgia as almost leverage for the West to, uh, I don't even know, give to Russia. <laughs> so if they desperately wanted Russia on their side, if China was just getting out of control, they might use those countries. Say, hey, you can bring your military in here as long as you ally with us against China. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, there's there's so much potential there. I mean, in many ways, it's such natural like allies if they just overcome the differences with like Ukraine and part of Eastern Europe there. Like they both really much fear China and the West isn't really interested in Central Asia. It's only pretty much Eastern Europe that's a big conflict zone. And of course, I mean, Middle East and other parts. Mm -hmm. But it's, to many ways, it kind of seems like it could be overcome to me. Yeah, but it also seems like the the main, or China could actually open its own front in the Middle East, like its own uh, neighborhood of allies. Like it already has Iran on their side. Mm. I don't see why Russia would not try to defend its interests there because Iran is literally on Russia's doorstep. And if they are allied against each other, that, that's just another window for Russia to, or that's just another weakness for Russia. Like in all seriousness, the United States and Russia need to stop their quarreling. <laughs> yeah, there's there's so much potential there. Exactly. So I think that's about enough. I think we did a great job today. All right, thank you. Yeah, it was a little bit hard for me. I'm not really used to doing it like this, but it's a little bit it's fun. okay, you did a great job. Thanks. I thought it got a little bit interesting there with the end. Yeah, we should continue this in another video. I'm okay. going to be doing like the regular geopolitics videos every for every two weeks now and one of these videos on every other week too. So I hope that you will be in one of these upcoming interviews again. All right, sure. Yeah, man, really cranking out that content. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, well, good luck with that. You're doing a great job with the channel. Thank you. And I... Wish you the best of luck for your channel, too. Yeah, I should get back to that, <laughs> doing that. <laughs> All right. All right, it's been great. I'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks, man. Bye.